So, I'm going to get it out of the way right now. I know the question that's on most of your minds, so I'm just going to answer it for you. Has Pastor Holbrook lost his mind for giving me the microphone? And the answer is quite possibly. But in all seriousness, I want to thank Pastor Holbrook and Pastor Tolson for supporting me and giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Now, the last few weeks leading up to this, I've been quite nervous. And I'm nervous right now. Hopefully, I'll get calmed down in a second. But um, I was looking for, like, the perfect words because I didn't want to get up here and look stupid. Well, then I realized that my church family that I love, they don't expect my words to be perfect. So I'm just going to talk from my heart. That's what I'm going to do tonight. So... I'll be the first to tell you I cannot quote scripture like Brother Cecil here can, but I hope to someday. But for today, I'm just honored and I'm grateful that I get to talk about the Lord. And I'm going to take a drink of water and try to get settled down. <laughs> Tonight, I want to talk to you about something that hits very close to home for me, and that is, why does God allow bad things to happen to people? Not just good people, but all people. Every time there's a mass shooting or a tragedy or anything bad that happens, that's usually the first question that people ask. Why would God allow this horrible thing to happen? And I believe there's several reasons for this, but I think there is a lot of good examples we can find in the book of Job. And I know that most of you are familiar with the book of Job, but um, for those of, on Facebook that might not be, I would like to take a second to talk about Job. So, back in the day, Job was very wealthy. He owned a lot of animals, he had a lot of land. He had a large family. He had seven sons and three daughters. But his greatest asset was his faith. And one day Satan was roaming the earth. And he was trying to tempt people and do evil and stuff. And God said to Satan, well, have you considered my servant Job? Because there's none like him in this earth. He's a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and he avoids evil. Of course, Satan come back and he said, well, of course Job's faithful. And um, he's not going to curse you because you've blessed him with everything. He's got everything. But if I were to take that from him, he surely would curse your face. So God allowed him to tempt Job. So he proceeded to take most of his wealth. He caused him to lose his animals. He even caused him to lose his children. Now one would think that Job would surely cuss the Lord for that, and, but he didn't. He dropped down on his knees and he worshiped the Lord and he remained faithful. So when this didn't work, um, the Satan then proceeded to um, plague Job with these sores and boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. He was in horrible, horrible pain. And um, But even then, of course, Job's like, why, God? Why are you allowing this to happen? But he didn't turn his back on the Lord. He remained faithful. He never lost his faith in God. Now, every one of us in here has had bad things happen. We've had tragedies, bad situations, some of us more than others. And um, we've all had complicated years, such as 2001, 9-11, biggest terrorist attack on U.S. soil, killed over 3,000 Americans. God didn't cause that, but he allowed it. 2020, COVID-19, made by man. God didn't cause it, but he allowed it. Now, my most complicated year 
was 20 years ago, 2002. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And now for the next few minutes, you are going to think that you're listening to an episode of Young and the Restless. But I promise you, bear with me, because I have a point to make at the end. So the year was 2002. We just went through 9-11, and the federal government had created thousands of federal air marshal positions. These marshals were responsible for being on airplanes, and they provided security. They were undercover, and they were to keep everyone safe. Now, at the time, my husband, my ex-husband, his name is Randy, and I don't want to confuse anyone. My current husband's name, Randy, as well. So, tonight, I'll be referencing the first Randy, but I didn't want anybody to get confused. So, anyway, first husband named Randy, he was an investigator for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. He worked in Lexington, where Art actually retired from. And um, one of his buddies that worked at the prison as well said, hey, Randy, he said, they posted all these federal air marshal jobs. He said, we could travel the world and have all kinds of fun and see the world and get paid a lot of money. Let's put in for it. So he did. And he was selected. Now, I knew my husband's decision to become a federal air marshal was going to be extremely difficult on our marriage. And the reason was, at that time, they didn't have air marshals in the Kentucky airports. So he was going to be uh, stationed in another state when he got out of training. Now, some of you may find this hard to believe because I'm a very strong-willed, independent woman, but I'm kind of old-fashioned, to be quite honest with you. I believe that the husband is the head of the household. Mm -hmm. I believe in supporting him. I believe in supporting him even when things are difficult. He makes decisions you may not agree with, decisions that doesn't make you happy. I believe you support him and that you trust that he's doing the right thing for the both of you. So I supported him in March, um, I think it was March the 24th, 2002. He went off to Albuquerque, New Mexico for um, 12 weeks. I mean, uh, yeah, 12 weeks, three months for his training. In the meanwhile, I stayed back and I was a lieutenant at North Point Training Center. And that was my job. My assignment at that time was the institutional hearing officer. And that's like the judge of the institution. When inmates would get into trouble, like for fighting, doing drugs, or disobeying a direct order, the officers would give them a disciplinary report. And they would report to my court call. I would hear their case, I'd hear their evidence. And then I would make a determination if they were guilty or not guilty, and I would assess a punishment. And I've been doing that for several years, never had any trouble, had a few that might want to cuss me, but for the most part, they were all very respectful. <coughs> but in, on April the 8th, 2002, I was driving to work. I didn't have a clue what was gonna happen in just two hours that an inmate was gonna try to take me hostage. So, I was sitting at the desk alone with the inmate, getting ready to start his hearing. He was rubbing his nose with a tissue, and he asked if he could get up and throw the tissue away at the trash can. I didn't think anything about it, and I said, sure. So he gets up, he throws the tissue away, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye, instead of him going back to his chair, he was, becoming behind, he was going behind me, and I thought to myself, what is he doing? That's how quick in prison that something will jump off. He put his left hand on my mouth, and in his right hand, he had a can lid, like off soup or vegetables or something. He had it folded over. He showed me that sharp can lid to my face, and then he put it up against my throat, and he told me to get up and not scream. So I did exactly what he said. So. He proceeded to lead me around this room like this, and I'm going with him. The whole time we're going around the room, I was a hot mess. I was so nervous. I'm like, oh my, is he going to kill me? Is he going to slit my throat? Is he going to attack me? You know, what's this inmate going to do? 
the more we got around the room, the more scared I got. And it, it was at that time I decided, I'm not going to wait and find out what he has in store for me. I'm going to fight him. So let me tell you, ladies, this is the only time it's good, and I was so happy to be a plus-size woman, because when my 200 pounds was resisting him, and I'm elbowing him and trying to keep that neck away from that can lid, he had to let go of something, because he was a tall, thin, lanky guy. He was young. He let go of my mouth long enough for my big mouth to scream, and I did. And when I screamed, an inmate come flying through the door, got the inmate off of me. Another inmate went and got help. And that day, the Lord saved my life. Of course, I was terrified, scared to death, and it didn't... Hello? <laughs> Did I turn it off? They're done to tired of hearing me talk. <laughs> That's all we can take. <laughs> Didn't want to hear the ending. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Technical um, difficulties. So anyway, it was a traumatic experience, especially since my husband was gone. I, I was home alone at night. It was hard. It was horrible. And also, that explains for you that always sees me sitting on the back pew. That's the exact reason why. It's not that I'm antisocial, but ever since that incident, I don't like people behind the head or neck because it kind of brings flashbacks. So that's the reason that you always see me pretty much on the back row. But I got through it, praise the Lord, and a few months later, my husband finished his training in New Mexico, and he was stationed in Pittsburgh. Now, I don't know if there's any Pittsburgh Steelers fans in here. Uh -oh. <laughs> it figures that the pastor would be. I am certainly not a fan of Pittsburgh, let me tell you. You will not see a jersey of that kind on me. And you will soon find out why. <laughs> but anyway, he was, stationed, he was stationed in Pittsburgh. And he would come home on his days off. Sometimes he got to fly, but most of the time he didn't have to drive. And he would be worn out because, I mean, flying, if, if you've flown, you know it's exhausting. So you can imagine if you're flying all over the world, hours on end, he was exhausted. So after a few weeks, um, I would tell him I felt bad for him. I'm like, why don't you just stay there this week? You know, get some rest. I don't want you to come home and be tired. Just stay there and get some rest. Well, the problem is that started happening more and more. Then it was every three weeks that he would come home. Well, finally, September the 21st, 2002, he calls me. It's the middle of the week. He's on his way home. He wasn't his days off, so I was wondering what's going on. He called and he told me, Julie, I got transferred to Cincinnati Airport. I'm moving back to Kentucky and I start tomorrow. Well, I was so happy, let me tell you. I was getting my handsome husband back. He's going to be home every night. And I'm thinking the world is perfect. Well, it was just for a few minutes. Because then he proceeded to say something that forever changed my life. I'll never forget it. And he said, Julie, he said, you have been the perfect wife. You haven't done anything wrong, and I love you. But this job is not for a married man. I want a divorce. This job is not for a married man. I want a divorce. I was devastated, devastated. Because we'd been together 11 years. We'd been married eight. I'd always supported him in his career. And I just couldn't believe my ears. And I begged him. I would have done anything to cut my husband. I wouldn't even cared what he'd done, any scene, whatever. I didn't want to lose my husband, but he was not giving me a choice. He didn't want to be with me anymore, and he was leaving me, and that was just something that I couldn't control. Two weeks later, I was driving home from work. It was in the rain. I was in a little sports car that I had bought earlier that year, and I decided I was going to pass somebody in the rain. Well, that decision didn't work out too well for me. I lost control of the car. It went through a fence, through a field, and it wrapped around a tree. Now, if you could have seen the wreckage, you would wonder how anyone survived that crash, much less 
walked out of it with scratches. I only had scratches, praise the Lord. And even though I wasn't hurt, my heart was still broken because my husband had just left me a few weeks prior to that. I was a hot mess, let me tell you. I mean, my friends and family, they didn't want to see me coming because that's all I talked about for months on end was how upset I was, how devastated I was, how much I prayed that God would bring him back. They didn't understand it. They didn't get it. They're like, are you crazy? Good riddance to him, you know. You just need to get over him. But they would. They would just turn and look at me when I'd start talking. They didn't even want to hear about it. One day I was at North Point, and a maintenance man that I wasn't even a close friends with, I knew him. We were not close friends. He pulled me aside, and he said, Julie, he said, everybody here is sick and tired of listening to you whine and complain and about your ex-husband leaving you. He said, he's a jerk, you need to move on. We're tired of hearing it. He said, you just need to come to work, do your job and go home. But you need to, you need to stop, you know. I went home, cried my eyes out. I couldn't believe that he had said that to me. But then I realized he was right. He was 100% right. I needed to move on with my life. No Prince Charming was gonna ride back up on a horse and save me, I was gonna have to save myself. And it's hard for you that no, a single person, they only have one income. They have all the bills of a married person. I lost my brand new home, I couldn't afford it on my salary, had to move to Danville. I had two different wiener dogs then. And there was times I didn't know if I could even feed my wiener dogs. But the good Lord took care of me and I made it. So then I got into the second church that I belonged to in Danville. I started going. I was there every time the door opened. Every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, New Year's Eve, didn't matter. If it was open, I was there, and I was very happy. But then, a couple years later, I meet Randy number two, and we started dating, and all of a sudden we got engaged really quickly. I'm planning weddings and receptions and honeymoons, and parties and guess what i did what a lot of christian people do you know when things are bad and you're ill and um things are wrong you're right there praying talking to the lord asking for his help you need him but when things are going good all of a sudden he's not as important you kind of put him on the back shelf you don't make him a priority because you don't need anything and that's exactly what i did and it didn't help that my husband did not go to church. Now, I told myself they had a new pastor and I didn't particularly like him. That was just an excuse because I could have went to any church, but I didn't. That's when I turned my back on the Lord. I told you about that in my last testimony for 16 years and didn't go to church. Well, that didn't work real well for me again because during those years, I had a lot of struggles and things I had to work through. And then in 2008, I got the surprise of my life. Now, all my life, from the minute I got high school, I never cared about a career. I never cared about a title. I never cared about money. The only thing that I ever wanted to be was a mom. That was it. And I had tried with both husbands. I had fertility issues. I even tried to adopt a child with the first husband. That didn't go well either. But um, I'd always wanted to be a mom. When well, 2008, I turned 43, ladies. I found out I was pregnant. Praise the Lord. I was so excited. And I then wore my friends out again. We talked about morning sickness. I talked about baby names. I talked about baby clothes. I talked about nursery themes. You know, all that stuff that a new mom does. Well, that happiness was short-lived too. Because in my 12th week, when to get an ultrasound, I had lost the baby. And I found myself saying, God, why? You know, why is all this stuff happening to me? And you know, the Lord allowed me to go through these challenges in 2002, but he never turned his back on me, never. And he probably should have, because I certainly wasn't serving him at that time in my life. And just like with Job, God allowed Satan to tempt his faith, but God was always in control. He always knew what was going to happen in the end. And in the end, he blessed Job with twice the wealth that was taken away from him. He blessed him with a family. 
a long, healthy, happy life. Now, the book of Job teaches us a lot of things. All the wealth, the possessions, our health, our life, everything we have, it's not ours, it's the Lord's. He gives us every single thing we have. We should be grateful because he giveth and he can taketh at any time. And that's sure what Job found out and we often find out as well. And God didn't have anything to prove to Satan. I mean, he didn't have anything to prove. Now here's why I, and Pastor Holbrook probably knows more of the reason for this than I do, but here's my theory on it. Here's why I think he allowed Satan to test Job's faithfulness. I think he did it for us today, all these years later, so we could see what it's like for a faithful servant of the Lord to obey God even under the worst circumstances. And I believe God doesn't do things to us, but he does it for us. And just as Pastor Holbrook referenced Sunday during his message, he said often times the Lord will, bad things will happen because he's leading you to where you need to be or where he wants you to be. Mm -hmm. And I believe also that, you know, unpleasant things happen because it draws us closer to him. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Another reason I think bad things happen, and, and I'm, I'm referencing me now, is that my own sin have, has caused a lot of my issues. I honestly believe that. I can look back on choices I've made in my life and sins that I've done. And, and I'm not that God tries to get people back. He doesn't. But I believe it contributed to it. So in 2002, some people would say that was the worst year of my life. But was it? You really think about it might have been the best year of my life because God saved me not once but three times that year he saved me when the inmate had a can lid to my throat he could have cut my throat at any time the Lord saved me when my husband left me I didn't have much of a desire to live he saved me when I wrapped that little sports car around a tree should never have walked away from that he let me walk away from that with scratches. I didn't even break anything, cut anything. So people don't drown because they fall in water. They drown because they never get out. I was drowning in 2002 in self-pity. And, and everyone, don't get me wrong, when tragic things happen, we're all going to mourn. We're all going to be sad for a certain amount of time, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when we let that go on for years and years, and we let that consume our life and let it define us and, and become us, I think that's when it's a problem. And I had done that. I had spent many years, you know, feeling sorry for myself, being upset, wanting my husband back. And, um, but when things get in the way of us serving the Lord, then we need to, to reevaluate it. I struggled for years, as I just said, to overcome these things. And praise the Lord, I was able to get my head above water. And I was, over, be, I was able to overcome it. Now, I would encourage you today, if there's something that you're struggling with, something in your past, something personal, anything that's interfering with your faith and your ability to serve the Lord, I would encourage you to let it go because God's going to always be there for you. He's in control. Things might seem bad now, and you may wonder, why is this happening? But God knows, and he's got a plan for you, and he's going to see you through it. In closing, I want to end with how my Young and the Restless episode um, ended. While it was extremely difficult for me to overcome that heartache from that divorce, um, I was able to move on, but most importantly, I was able to actually forgive him. Now, a lot of my friends and family, they do not understand that because they hated him for what he did to me, breaking my heart. But I just couldn't hate a man that I was married to that I had a lot of good memories and years with. I had far more good times than I had bad. And so I just 
I, I just could not hate him. And, and this is odd and it doesn't work for everyone, but we are currently friends. He lives in Florida. He's friends with Randy number two. And we have vacationed there. When he comes to Kentucky, he always stops and sees us. So I hold, I hold no bad feelings uh, towards him. And as crazy as this may sound, I believe that I'm right where God wants me to be. Yes. Because yes. If, if the first Randy had left me, I'm quite confident that I would have never changed my life. I don't think I'd have been serving the Lord. I don't think I would have been going to heaven. I know I wouldn't have been at Harrington Lake. So I believe that God allowed all those things that happened to me in 2002. I believe he, ha he allowed those things so they would lead me right to where he wanted me to be. And that's here. So what I thought was a tragedy at the time ended up probably being the biggest blessing ever in my life. So, and I, I told those, uh, Pastor Holbrook, don't let me have that microphone because uh, I've got one more thing to say and I'm done. And I do apologize. I was extremely nervous when I first got up here. I didn't think that, I, I thought Art was going to have to come on up here. I'm going to be honest with you. I was shaking. I felt lightheaded. I thought I was going to pass out. Now, I think I gained my composure after a few sentences, but it took me a minute. So I apologize for the very beginning. I, I was very nervous. And, and uh, Miss Jackie had said this before when she has got up here that uh, you just have no idea what these preachers go through because preparing and standing in front of people and talking, it's very nerve wracking. And the Lord got me through it. Thank you, thank you. But uh, I have a whole new respect for both the pastors here and Miss Jackie and everyone else that teaches, Brother Cecil and everyone here that gets up here because it is nerve-wracking. But in my final words, and I'm going to be quiet and hand the microphone back to the pastor, um, I want to thank my brothers and sisters in Christ here. So many of you reached out on Facebook, and you supported me, and you encouraged people to come, and you sent me little notes, and you said, I know you can do it. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart for supporting me and making me feel more at ease. It, it meant the world to me. I want to thank all my friends and coworkers. They've actually, a lot of them, well, none of them come except for Miss Mary Ann. Thank you so much. But they, they sent me lots of emails and texts and calls this last week telling me, you've got this. You're going to do a great job. We look forward to hearing you and watching you on Facebook, and I appreciate that as well. I want to give a special thank you to Julie. She's one of my good Christian friends. It's my neighbor. And she's prayed and prayed with me over this service, hoping that it would go well. And as the pastor pointed out, that maybe words that the Lord gives me would, would touch someone if they had a special need. And that's all I wanted. I, I don't want the spotlight on me. And I... I don't pronounce things correctly, and I say, um, way too many times, but, uh, but I hope that someone got something out of that. And last, I would like to thank uh, Prophet Michael Ferguson. He's a good friend of mine. He's a uh, Pentecostal uh, preacher out of London, Kentucky, Corbin, and um, he has studied with me, and he has prayed for me on so many occasions. So thank you, Michael. I know that you're going to be watching this. And last but not least, my favorite sister, Mary. She is my inspiration, my rock. She's always there. She tells me, Julie, calm down. You can do this. And I love you, Mary. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. Amen.